I'd like to talk today about how to survive war. Hmm. Um, Lord put this in my mind the other night, and I thought, you know, there's a lot of different types of war that a Christian can face. Um, you can face actual physical war with guns and bullets and bombs and all the other things. Um, you can face spiritual war, and you can and will face spiritual war as a Christian. Um, but there's other types of warfare that we're dealing with right now. There's economic warfare, there's famines, artificial created famines coming very soon here in 2022. Um, a lot of different types of war. Cyber warfare and, and uh, power grid stuff being taken down and all kinds of things. And we're facing a lot of different bad things coming in the future. I don't think anybody can argue with that. And um, I've never been in the military. My wife was in the Army and the Navy. Um, I've known a lot of different people in the military and things. And um, I have a lot of problems with the modern military. Not because I'm against fighting and war and soldiers, but because of all the political stuff that goes along with uh, the modern military system. Um, our soldiers are used mostly as guinea pigs. Um, and they're put into wars that they aren't allowed to win. They have, there's restrictions put on how they fight. It's just a bunch of stupid nonsense. And a lot of young men get drawn in to the military thinking that they're going to serve their country and fight for freedom. And as they get older, they start to realize this thing's actually a scam. And uh, there's a lot of issues there. But the concept of being a soldier and fighting is what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm not promoting the United States military or any other military out there, um, but like the Apostle Paul did in Ephesians chapter 6, he compared Christians to a Roman soldier. If you look at the armor, the way that the armor is and everything else, um, he's comparing to a Roman soldier. So I'm going to be comparing, giving you some real world ways to survive war. Um, and this will apply across the board to any kind of war that goes on. And uh, I think it's very important. It's a very timely study because um, there are Christians that right now are, face, or are going through actual physical war uh, with guns and bullets and the whole deal. Um, and we don't know what we could be facing in the future, but there will be some level of warfare that we are facing. So I'm going to go over these seven different things, and then we'll get into some scriptures on this. Um, first and foremost, you need to determine in your mind what you are willing to die for. All right, you join up in the military, you join up and you get saved, get into the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're now a good soldier of Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures. We'll go over that here in a little bit. Um, you need to determine in your mind how far are you willing to go. What is the hill that you're willing to die on, as they say in the military. What are you personally willing to die for? All right. Um, number two, you need to maintain your morale. Sometimes your only job will be to survive the day. If you haven't been in that yet spiritually, you will at some point in time. You will go through some really bad times. Uh, we'll get back into that here as we continue. Third way to survive war. Stay positive, but not careless. You are at war. Don't forget that you're at war, in other words. Um, maintain, maintaining morale, you have to stay somewhat positive, but you can't get too careless. All right. Number four, your duty is to kill or be killed. Every dead enemy means another fellow soldier lives. Now, I will be tying it into the scriptures and how we're supposed to be, live as Christians, but... Um, you can't dwell on the thing of uh, how the enemy died and their family and whatever. You, you're at war, okay? You have to think to yourself of, you know, your objective is to kill enemy soldiers. And if you don't, they're going to kill you. That's just the way it is. Um, number five, way to survive war. Um, focus on the battle, not on the cares of this world. Keep your mind focused on the battle, not on the cares of this world. That's another one that's very important. Number six, your weapon is the tool that will keep you alive. Take care of it. Now, how does that apply to a Christian? 
We'll get more into that. And number seven, if your commanding officer promotes you, it means greater, not less, responsibilities. Oh, I just want to be promoted. I just want to be bigger and more respected and everything else. Okay, then it will lead to greater responsibilities. Hmm. So, let's go through it now with the scriptures. First, we have that you need to determine in your mind what you are willing to die for. Um, there's a lot of different times that soldiers get into battle and, they, and get into some war and they're, I should say war, not battle, but they go into a war and there's a particular battle and they realize this is a suicide mission. I don't like the way things are working out here. This doesn't look so good for me. I don't know if I want to do this. What are you willing to die for? You get into the black ops world and whatever else, a lot of times after your job is complete, your mission is complete, um, you're sacrificed. You start messing around with the CIA and whatever else when you're in the military, they will oftentimes sacrifice you after they're done with you because you represent a problem. You could talk about what you did and whatever else and that could get back and make problems for the, the you know, organization there, uh, the company as it's called. Um, Gene Chip Tatum is a good example of that. I was used in special operations in the Vietnam War, and they basically wiped out his whole unit. He was the only one that survived. Um, and many other, SEAL Team 6 and all these other guys, you know, you hear stories about these, you know, they do some kind of a heroic thing, and all of a sudden there's a helicopter crash, or this happens, or that happens, or whatever else. You have to understand that in your mind and say, what am I willing to die for? All right, how far should I go with this? Philippians chapter 1, we'll go there. How far, now switching it over to the spiritual, how far do you go as a Christian before you say, hey, you know what, um, you know, they just passed some law that I'm not allowed to have bumper stickers on my vehicle or whatever else, or I'm not allowed to go out and pass out tracks in front of this store and street preach on this corner or whatever else. How far do you go with that? Okay, what are you willing to die for? You know, they're having some sodomite pride rally in another county over that way. Am I willing to go and protest it knowing I could go to jail for that? How far do you go? If you're a young person living at home um, and your parents say, hey, you know what? I don't want to hear about your Jesus stuff. You can do that in your room and find whatever. It's up to you. But if you keep, you know, pounding us with your Bible here, thumping us with your Bible, we're kicking you out on the street. How far do you go? as a Christian. Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I may in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul was willing to die. Paul was willing to go out there and he was willing to be beaten with rods, like he talked about, and people chasing him from one city to the next, and, and they were conspiring and trying to kill him and everything else. But Paul was a single man. The single man... In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it talks about the single man cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man, like me, I care for the things of the world, how I may please my wife. You have to be careful if you're married. It doesn't mean, you well, then no, I don't have to serve the Lord or something. No, I just have to understand what battle I'm going into. What am I willing to die for? If I die because I did some stupid thing... Um, it's going to affect my wife and my son. There's no provider then for them. I have to think about that. See, well, there's some guy and he's, and he's uh, holding hostages or something like that. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and I, you know, I could go witness to the guy. Yeah, but he's got a gun. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm ready to go home to be with the Lord. Yeah, but my wife and my son aren't ready for me to go home to be with the Lord. You see? I have to think about that. 
I am not willing to die in some for some reason that will cost you know an unnecessary reason that will cost my wife her husband and my son his father I have to think about them I have to provide for them you know the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 about how that if any provide not for his own he is worse than an infidel he's denied the faith he denied the faith and is worse than an infidel I think is how it's worded I have to provide for my wife and my son. I have to think about that. If you're single, well, it's a different thing that applies to you. What are you willing to die for? Um, <clears throat> okay, hey, they passed this this thing now where you have to take this, you know, hokey pokey in order to get your, you know, keep your job or whatever. Are you willing to do that? You're willing to have that satanic stuff put into you? Cultured on, on uh, many of them are cultured on aborted baby tissues. I'm not going to have that put into me. That's something I'd be willing to die for. Oh, we're going to send around military teams and whatnot and things. Um, well, that's nice. Whatever. I'm not going to have it put in me. Well, we'll, you know, have to execute you and then, it, then execute me. That's one that's a, it's a no-go for me. Um, you know, they come out with some other kind of a thing and it doesn't cause me to, you know, contradict the scriptures, you know, uh, well, okay, I'll think about it. I'll pray about it. But uh, you have to determine that thing in your mind. What am I willing to die for? Secondly, maintain your morale. Sometimes your only job will be to survive the day. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, if you've never been there, if you've never had that experience yet, where the depression is on a level that is just unreal, and it's very hard to even get through the day, if you haven't had that experience yet, you will, as a Christian. Um, I do not preach life enhancement, okay? Just believe in Jesus and everything just gets wonderful from then on. Um, well, in terms of eternity, you put your faith in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, the blood that he shed on the cross to pay for your sins. Um, he saves you. You're born again. Yeah, eternity is going to be wonderful, uh, better than we can even you know, imagine. But uh, life on this earth can oftentimes be very rough for you as a Christian. Your family, your friends can turn, not can, they will turn against you. Um, you'll be an outcast. Uh, things get pretty bad. And sometimes the spiritual attacks are happening and there's other things going on and and um, it's really bad. Uh, sometimes you just have to get through it. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what, I can't do anything else today. I'm just going to survive. I'm just, I don't feel like going any place. I don't feel like sleeping. I don't feel like eating. I don't feel like watching videos or whatever. I'm just in this really spiritually depressed thing. I, I just need to go sing some hymns and just, if I can just make it through the day, that's all that matters. Sometimes it'll get that bad. And if we go into actual physical warfare in this country, or you go into it in your country, that might be the only thing that you have to think about. Get your King James Bible, having food in your stomach and raiment, clothes on your back, and your King James Bible, and run. And get away from there and I'm never going home again because I don't have a home anymore. It's, that whole town got bombed or whatever else. Sometimes you might get to that level. You know, as Christians. Christians have in the past. But uh, let's read here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that ye, as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. <laughs> sentence of death within ourselves. Yeah. Um, I die daily to this world. And uh, I'll tell you what, this last uh, last number of months has been probably the roughest, one of the roughest times in my life. 
uh, lost my father and, and um, you know, had a really bad injury with my back and, and uh, you know, found out some other things, which I'm not sure when I'll bring it out or if I'll bring it out. Um, there were more lies about my family. Just to say this, I, if you don't know, if you didn't hear the story, I have a uh, half-brother that I never knew. My dad kept it from me for all the years that uh, I was growing up. And it turns out I have another one. Um, like I said, I don't know if I'll go off on that story, but I have two half-brothers. Um, my parents were not the people that I thought that they were. And they lied to us. They deceived us over the years. And that's, that was very hard for me to hear that. And, um, you know, I've really had to examine a lot about my life and go back through things. And, and uh, there are some things I'll never change. You know, the book, you'll never take this book from my hands unless I'm dead with a bullet between my eyes or something. You aren't taking the book from me ever. Uh, this is my lifeline. <laughs> you kidding me? I'm going to go from this blessed book, this amazing, beautiful book, back to an NIV or something? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, well, the ESV or something. Uh, you're not getting me any to anywhere near any of these stupid Vatican versions. It's not happening. I hate the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church with a passion. If you haven't figured that out by now. But uh, it's been a rough year. Um, been going through some real spiritual struggles and, and been really getting hit with some spiritual things and stuff I've never experienced before, uh, which we'll get back to that in a little bit. But um, it's been tough. And there have been times when literally just trying to maintain my morale, trying to keep going and, and um, you know, and I, there's all I can do some days is just say, okay, just get through the day. Just, you know, I'm not going to accomplish anything today because it's just really depressing and whatever else. And I just get through the day and that's it. And you say, why are you telling us this? Because uh, I'm trying to encourage you. Uh, if you're going through the same thing, if you have really bad days, really bad things that you're going through, uh, you're not alone. Um, I go through it. Even with all the Lord's done through this ministry and everything else, there's no happy time when you get to a place where the devil doesn't attack you or something. Uh, that's not the case. Um, the devil hates us as Christians. And he wants to destroy us. We have an enemy. And, um, and the world... The three enemies of a Christian is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And um, the world is our enemy. They don't really think much of us. <laughs> the flesh, your own flesh, having to fight yourself, your own lusts and whatever else. And the devil, he's got it in for us. He's the accuser of the brethren. Accuses us day and night before the throne. Up there in heaven, you know, before the Lord. And he's saying, yeah, did you see what he did? Did you see what she did? Look at that down there. He did this and she did that. And they look at... Yeah, accusing us before the Lord. It's rough. I mean, you, you know, you go into actual warfare and the most feared soldiers in war, um, as far as infantry is concerned, is uh, the sniper. Why? Because they can strike without any kind of warning. You know, if it's some kind of a, you know, warfare has changed so much since the, in the last 100 years, but you go back to World War I, it was trench warfare. You get the guys down the trenches and there's the no man's land and the enemy lines, you know, lines of demarcation are very clear. There's the Germans, here's the Americans or whatever other, you know, soldiers are fighting in World War I. We already know where the enemy's at. We have to try to break through the line and they come up out of the trenches and they run through no man's land and they're shooting at the enemy and then, you know, they turn around and go back down into their trench and the enemy comes and charges them, you know. But now, uh, now it's not quite that clear anymore in warfare, um, especially when you get into some of the stuff where they're going through, you know, urban settings and things, urban warfare. I, oh, man, talk about a nightmare going house to house. And is this house booby trapped? And are there people, are there snipers over there in that window or, you know, there's crosshairs on the side of my head right now? I don't even know it. Yeah. And the sniper thing, you know, all of a sudden there's, you know, some guy drops down and, and you hear a gun going off. You know, that's some scary stuff. But uh, let's go to the next one. Stay positive. First Peter chapter 5. Um, 
no matter what we're going to go through here in the future, brethren, you have to stay positive. You have to set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. You have to think about eternity sometimes. 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I've made this point before in other studies, but the fact is, lions don't roar until they've killed their prey. A lion is very stealthy. I mean, you get some of these lions, they're very big, and they, they're down, crouching down and stalking through the grass, and they will jump and pounce on their victim and when they have you down and they're ripping you apart and eating you while you're still alive then they roar well, that's a picture of the devil the devil is the most subtle beast of the field the bible talks about he can creep around and he can get you in the in ways you never even thought of you know there's just no way you know i remember the first time i heard about this fact that my father kept an illegitimate birth from me um i th no no couldn't be and, and everything and I was not convinced. And then later on I saw the evidence and the proof and I thought, okay, yeah, it's, it's the truth. And I've had people that, you know, friends of the ministry and whatever else, and boy, they come in and they're very subtle and, and things. And it goes for a little while. A lot of times they'll, they'll string me along for a while and then they just turn around and stab me right, stab me right in the back. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had that happen. Um, Quite a few people that uh, I once was in great fellowship with and really encouraged by, and then they just turned on me like a vicious lion. Um, but look at verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. You can resist the devil. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Um, we're all going through stuff, okay? So that's why I tell you some of the stuff that goes on in my life personally, the bad things that happen, because I've heard the stories out there, the marriages that are bad, be it the wife is rotten and the husband is struggling with her, or the husband's rotten and the wife is struggling with him, and I hear that. I hear of you know families that are not talking anymore, grandparents that can't see the grandchildren because the grand you know, the, their sons and daughters are, are wicked and they say, oh, we don't want our children around you wicked, you know, we, you weird grandparents and things. I've heard that. It's heartbreaking. You know, families, young people that are in their homes and their parents and their families are just make fun of them all the time and they're saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Young girls that are at home and they're, their family saying, go out and get a job. Go on and get a job and everything. And they're saying, it's not right. It's not what's in the Bible. Well, I don't care about your Bible. You know, and a young woman's there and her father's supposed to be taking care of her. He's supposed to be her spiritual head or spiritual covering, but he's trying to push her out of the home, trying to send her out there among all the wolves and, and all these wicked men out there that want to fornicate with her and everything else. It's terrible. And, you know, I could go on and on. Uh, people that are lonely, people that have nobody to talk to and, and whatever else. That's why I'm trying to exhort you right now. You're not alone. You understand? You say, why is this happening? Because we're at war. That's what we're going through. Our time to fight is right now. Our time to go through some things is right now. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. You're going to suffer for Jesus Christ if you get saved. When God saves you, when He calls you and says, you know, into, into ministry of some kind, He says, okay, now you're mine, you're going to suffer. Let's continue. Um, number four, your duty is to kill or be killed. Every dead enemy means another fellow soldier lives. Another way to look at it. Acts chapter 9. Go to the book of Acts chapter 9. And we'll see something interesting here about a man that had to suffer. Acts chapter 9. Verses 1 and 2. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues 
that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Saul was going out and he was having a good time killing Christians. He enjoyed it. It was a, a fun thing for him. He was very fervent. And you know what? There's a lot of uh, Saul's out there that uh, all they want to do is just destroy you. They might be your family members. They might be your co-workers. They might be your former friends. They might be people here online. Um, it's a great frustration to me to see so many people that, you know, don't take heed to my warnings. And they'll go out, they get messed up in hyper-Calvinism or hyper-dispensationalism. Or they'll get into the, you know, easy believism stuff or the new versions or whatever else. And they just get messed up. Um, I pray that you watch my videos and take heed to what I'm saying. Uh, listen to what I'm saying. Uh, and, you know, uh, well, brother, I, I just had to kind of, you know, I, I can't agree with you 100% anymore. Well, I hope it's because you found something in the scriptures where I'm wrong. I hope it's not because you need to compromise to go along with the world. See, if your disagreements with me are based on you trying to find loopholes to compromise and go back to the world, then you're wrong. If your differences with me are because you found something in the scriptures that you know I don't line up with, well then praise the Lord. I'm glad for that. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. But I just hope that you uh, change because this book tells you to change, not because I tell you to change. Okay? But we see Saul here, and he is definitely an enemy of Christians. He's trying to kill Christians. But what happens to Saul? Go down to uh, verse 10 in Acts chapter 9. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Good thing to say if you're a soldier. I'm here. Yes, sir. <laughs> and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Did Jesus ask him his opinion? Did Jesus say to him, hey, Ananias, I have something. You can accept it, reject it. It's up to you. He gave him an order. Kind of like a military commander. Almost like your life is not your own. You're bought with a price. Huh. Yeah. And what's Ananias say? Verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Uh, Lord, you know, I mean, why would he even say that? Same reason I would say it, or you would say it. Here's some head inquisitor. Here's some Jesuit provincial. And this guy hates Bible-believing Christians. Can't stand them. He's putting them in prison. And the Lord says, hey, I want you to go to that guy's house. Uh, Lord, are you sure about that one? Oh, that sounds kind of like a suicide mission to me, Lord. You want me to go to that guy's place? You know? Hey, um, there's this military base, and uh, there's a general that's there just for the weekend. I want you to go and take the guy out. Into a military base? Oh, you know, what kind of support am I going to have? No, just you alone. Huh? Yeah, here's a here's a handgun with a silencer on it. Um, I want you to go in there and get that guy. <laughs> huh? You know, just using a secular military way of saying it. Uh, uh, Lord, uh, <laughs> sometimes Lord might have you do a dangerous mission. Sometimes you'll be in a store and just the minding your own business and everything else, and Lord will say, put a track down. Or you'll hear some conversation and they'll say, I just wish I knew what was going on in this world. So, just so crazy. And the Lord says, go speak to him. Uh, well, Lord, you know, well, look at the time. I, I, I really need to kind of... You know. Be ready for the Lord to give you an assignment. And um, when he does, follow the orders and he'll bless you. Don't disobey your commanding officer, if you know what I mean. But look at verse 15. 
Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. <laughs> um, hey, don't worry about it, Ananias. I got this one covered. Go thy way. Make it happen. I've chosen him. He's one of mine. And I'm going to show him how great things he has to suffer for my name's sake. And I didn't read the whole chapter there. You know, when Saul gets knocked to the ground, he gets kicked off his high horse, so to speak. Um, he's down there on the ground. And he's blind. And he says, sees this great light and everything. And the Lord reveals himself to him. And, you know, who art thou, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. You know, so Saul knows. He knows what's happened. But Ananias is looking at this thing and thinking, you know, he probably didn't know about what happened on the road to Damascus. But even if he did, he could still be thinking, okay, it might have made him madder. Maybe he's even more of a fanatic now against, you know, Christians. And when he comes and his eyes open up, he might say, you, you're one of them. Or, you know, Saul didn't, or uh, Ananias didn't know. He didn't know what he was going to be going into. But the Lord said, I'll take care of it. I have a mission for you, Ananias. I have a mission for you, Christian. He has missions for me. Why? Because he bought me with a price. My life is no longer my own. Um, I feel called to the Lord to go and, and uh, you know, hang out on the beaches of the Caribbean or something, or I'm just going to go and uh, snowmobile across Alaska or something like that. That's not my decision to make, you know? A lot of times people get frustrated with me and things. I've heard that, you know, well, you're changing your, your way or you, you said you were going to do this. Now you're doing that. Now, you, whatever. I get orders from the Lord. And there's sometimes it's my understanding of what I'd like to do. I'd like to do, you know, whatever. And the Lord brings a bunch of people along and they say, hey, could you please preach on this? Or could you preach, please preach on that? And I get sidetracked and I think, okay, I have to do that. People send me some really good information and sometimes I can read it. A lot of times I can't. People send me books. I can't get to those and think, what's it about? I just have to be open to the Lord, you know, giving me orders. Uh, we went to a, a farm today where we get some uh, things, you know, milk and, and whatever else. And uh, they didn't have enough for us. And usually we go once a week. And it's a pretty long drive to get there. And so, you know, we do our trip once a week and fine. But they didn't. They only had a third of what we normally get. So I have to go back again this week. That's frustrating. But I have to look at this situation and say, okay, there's a reason why that happened. There's a reason that God has that I need to go back there again. What's the mission? I don't know. But I have to trust the Lord. And if the Lord has some... Uh, lost sinner that needs to be killed, so to speak, um, that they need to have the gospel presented to them in such a way that it'll, you know, kill their self-righteous pride and they'll start to think about eternity. Um, okay, I have to believe the Lord's going to set it up so that somebody, that person, gets behind my vehicle and they see uh, Acts chapter 16 there, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Um, they see my website, go to the website, boom. I don't know, but we have to be open to that. And if you get into a war type of situation, um, it's a spiritual war, then you have to spiritually kill. If it's a physical war and, and your, it, your life is at risk and whatever else, you might have to physically kill. I don't know, but that's how you survive. Um, number five, focus on the battle, not on the cares of this world. Second Timothy chapter two. It's very easy sometimes to get sidetracked. You kind of, you know, the thing of staying positive, but don't forget that you're at war. Don't get careless. Well, if you get into the cares of the world, careless, you know, cares, you get into the cares of the world. A lot of times you start to forget yourself. You start watching secular videos on YouTube or whatever else, and pretty soon you start to forget your walk with the Lord. And you start to put this Bible down and everything else. 
dangerous, very dangerous. Second Timothy chapter two, verse three and four. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardness, not softness. Um, as a Christian, you have to be gentle. You have to be meek and everything else. But uh, that's your outward thing that you do for people. Um, inwardly, you have to endure hardness. You have to get through the emotional trauma of having family turn against you. You have to get through that. You have to get through the threats and the, you better do this or else or you know whatever things that you get threatened with you have to get through that stuff you're enduring hardness it's teaching you verse 4 no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier um i have dreams of where i'd love to live and i see houses and things and i've always been interested in architecture for a very many years. Um, I studied a lot of different things about log building and timber frame construction, you know, post and beam is another way to say it. And I've, you know, really seen some neat houses and things. I have a lot of books on it right around the corner there going in through the hallway. Um, you know, I've studied it for a long time and I've had dreams about the, the dream place I'd like to build and whatever. But it's become more and more apparent to me that I'm not here for my dreams. I'm here as a soldier for Jesus Christ. And um, if I'm doing things and living in such a way that it pulls me too far away from the ministry, then I need to repent of that and I need to make a change. And um, that's been a major thing for me, uh, just giving up more of myself, more of my dreams and whatever else as time goes by. Uh, I'm called to fight. That's what I'm supposed to do. Um, you can't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. Now, you know, you can have certain things and whatever else. Like I said earlier, you know, if you're married, you have to care about the things of the world in the sense of you have to provide for your own, certainly. But uh, you can't get so caught up in that stuff and think about your image and your, you know, I can't drive some little small pickup truck because what would the guys down at the gas station think of me or something or at the garage or wherever you can't get into that stuff um you have to think of a thing of okay can i if i get a bigger size truck could i put more bumper magnets on it <laughs> um you know if i get a motorcycle um is it something that will save me gas money or is it something that's going to make me look cool and, you know we could go over a lot of different examples of that but that's stuff you need to think about as a Christian. Number six, your weapon is the tool that will keep you alive. Take care of it. Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four. Most important thing in this world is this book right here. That's why it's up on top of the hill there. All right. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What's the him there? It's referring to the scriptures. So, no, yeah, it is. You can just look at the thing there. Well, it's a false translation. That's your problem then, okay? <laughs> These people out there, you want, to, you want to know the reason why a lot of people reject this book? Because they don't want to experience this book. You know why I will never, ever reject this King James Bible? Because I live it. I try to live as close to this book as I can, and the Lord has given me experiences where I can look and I can say, boy, I can relate to what you went through, Lord, in my own small, feeble little way. Boy, I can relate to what the Apostle Paul went through. Boy, I can relate to what did Peter did there and how he was so stupid he said this, and I can relate to what John went through, and I can go back here to Moses, and I can see that I want to experience the book. And when you experience this book and it becomes real to you, nobody will ever take it from you. Because you understand it's a spiritual book. 
This isn't some kind of a book of uh, Garfield's favorite funny moments or, you know, Garfield the cat, okay? Um, you know, uh, Peanuts' favorite uh, comics or whatever with Snoopy and, you know, Charlie Brown. And, you know, that's not what this book is. Aesop's fables or Mother Goose, you know, story time things and what? No, no. This book is spiritual. If you open up this book and you say, God, show me this book. Prove this book is real to me. He will do that. And you'll get such a close connection with this book and you realize this is a sword. This is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's a... Uh, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, they are different, by the way, to the modalists out there, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <laughs> you know, it, what really angers lost people is when you start to apply this book to them. They come along and they'll say, well, I, I appreciate the King James Bible. It certainly is It's a lovely translation. Certainly one of the best ever written. But, little horns of the goat, but it's not God's perfect word. It's not the inspired word. It's not this, it's not that. You say, what is? If it's not the King James, then what is it? Well, I personally prefer the ESV. Now, for some studies and sometimes when I'm preaching, it's nice to have the NIV because more of a relatability to my lost crowd. <laughs> you know, and you say, uh, you know what? You uh, remind me of Genesis chapter three. You can be as God's knowing good and evil. Um, you are your own God. They don't like that. Well, why would you? You're judging me? So then you would judge me? You don't even know me. And then they'll get all angry and everything else. Yeah. Um, hey, you know what? There, ma'am, you remind me of the adulterous woman back here in the book of Proverbs. Let me turn to this and read it to you. Get that book away from me, you Bible thumper. Um. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Let me show you that back here. And <laughs> you go on and on. This book will judge people. And then they get mad at you for reading it. The only way for you to survive war, brethren, is to understand what this book says. And that's why so many people are saying, well, I believe in Jesus, but I just reject the Bible. Um, it's not a good thing. Let's just take the Bible away for a minute, okay? Here, take it out of my hands. I'll put it down here. I have no Bible. Back here, nothing. There is nothing there. Um, hey, uh, looks like this thing with the war with Russia and Ukraine, it could get a lot worse. Um, and I've been even hearing some rumors that China is going to go after Taiwan. Huh. Uh, what do you think it's leading to? I don't know. Um, hey, I heard this thing about that the uh, Federal Reserve is talking about having their own, you know, central bank digital currencies and, and things and, and that they want to have everybody, they want to get rid of cash and they want to have everybody just kind of in a digital monetary system. I wonder what that leads to. I don't know. I mean, without the Bible, who can tell? Um... Hey, I have a family member that's that's dying. I wonder what happens after death. <laughs> you see, if you really truly were, if these people were honest that don't believe in the King James Bible and they just said, yeah, okay, and there is no such thing as a translation that's inspired. We can't really say that anyone's God's perfect written word. Do you realize the horror that's there? I can't say anything for sure. Hey, you know, maybe Buddhism is, Buddhism is the right one, or maybe the Roman Catholic system, or maybe Islam, or maybe, you know, Hinduism, or whatever. Who's to say? Hey, um, why don't you go on out to the battlefield? Um, so, okay, I, I need a weapon. Oh, uh, yeah, here's a gun. We just designed this. There you go. What for caliber is this? Oh, brand new caliber. We just kind of, we're experimenting with it right now, but that's okay. You're going out there onto the battlefield and it's going to be a really heated battle, but unproven rifle and really not really all that well-tested ammo, but there you go. Hope for the best.
No, um, if I'm going to go onto the battlefield, I want to have a weapon that I know will work, that's worked for many years. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, it's okay. Just give me the new experimental, you know, the glossy covered, you know, newest, you know, new revised standard version Catholic edition or something, Catholic youth Bible or something, you know, that I'll try that out, see how it works. No, thank you. And finally, if your commanding officer promotes you, it means greater, not less, responsibilities. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. <coughs> James chapter 3, verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. My brethren... Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. You mess up in the military <clears throat> and you're a private, okay? Or corporal or something like that. Slap on the hand. Um, okay, we have to make you go do KP duty or some other kind of a thing or whatever to punish you. Whatever. Um, <clears throat> you go up to the level of a sergeant, you do the same thing might bust you down a rank or two, um, some really bad thing and whatever in the military. Then you go up to a commissioned officer and you're up there and you're getting higher and higher and pretty soon you're a colonel and then you're heading towards general and whatever else and you do something wrong. The punishment gets worse and worse. Hey, I'm, I'm just in here to the military. I just, you know, I volu volunteered for this. Okay, uh, what do I do here? Again? Okay. Yeah, how long do I have to be in the oh, four years? Okay, all right. All right, I'm out of here. I spent my time, I served my time, served my country. Yeah, okay, never went beyond the rank of what I came in for. I just messed around the whole time, whatever. But what if you're a general? Um, if you get to the very highest levels of the military, do you think you have to sacrifice some things? You get up there, you're a commissioned officer now and everything, and you have all these troops that depend on you, and you have all this logistical stuff that you have to take care of and get these things shipped over to there, and you get this, we need a new shipment of ammo coming in, and we have to get uniforms for this thing, and here we have to do this, and uh, here comes the guy in, and he's going to give you the recon report. I'm just throwing a bunch of stuff together. I'm, I realize that there are officers that wouldn't, if you're doing supplies, you probably don't care about what, you know, guys from recon are coming in and telling you about the advances of the enemy or something. But my point is, the more you go up in the military, the greater your responsibilities become. And if you're going to be used of the Lord, spiritually speaking, and you start out as a brand new convert, um, you say, Lord, I, I just want to be a, a preacher someday. Boy, I just want to be a preacher. Um, you better realize what you're getting yourself into. Um, you're going to get hit hard. Uh, I can tell you, it was, it was fairly easy early on. <laughs> Um, when I first started to get into ministry and things, I mean, I had people turn against me and whatever else, and it went through some some pretty bad times. But, man, uh, now that the Lord's been using me in full-time ministry, oh, man, it has been incredible, the amount of attacks, of attacks and things. And, and um, you know, the, the power of the Lord is very great uh, through this ministry, and I thank Him for that. But the attacks sometimes that I get, man, I mean, if you've been with this ministry for a long time, you know what I'm talking about, the kind of things that have happened over the years. Um, it's been pretty ferocious at times. I don't know of many other ministries that have gone through what I've gone through. Um, no glory to me at all. Believe me. I'm just trying to warn you. Just trying to prepare you. And I, I have said something over the years, and I will stick to it till the day of my death, and that is, if the Lord Jesus waited till he was 30 years old to go into ministry, um, every young man out there should be waiting till at least 30 years old before he's in any kind of a real full-time ministry type of a thing. Um, I've seen young men just make a mess of things. They get prideful, that pride thing, that's what the Bible talks about, a novice, um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and they'll just get so prideful sometimes and just... I'm, you know, I mean, I've seen these guys in these church buildings and they'll just get, you know, I'm going to preach and I'm this, you know, this young little whippersnapper up there and he's got his little suit 
and tie on and you know and he's you know doesn't you know he's got these little skinny girl hands and things and he's up there and he's going to preach the word of god and he's going to raise his voice and pound the pulpit you know with his little high voice and and i just think oh, man that's not good <laughs> um i really think if you're a young man um, you really need to spend some time in some kind of a thing where you're working with your hands. Um, be an auto mechanic. Be a carpenter. Um, work in a butcher shop. You know, uh, I mean, if the military wasn't so corrupt, I'd tell you to go into the military. You know, um, don't go into the military. You're going to be put into a war that you're not allowed to win, and you'll ultimately probably get killed. And they, you know, use you as a, a pin cushion for the you know vaccine experimental vaccines for you know big pharma um don't go in the military <laughs> but there's a lot of things that young men can do to really learn a lot of life skills and that's what gets you strong okay you say well i'm going to go into the ministry when i'm you know 15 years old or something like this eh, you know be careful be very careful um you know, Bob Jones Sr., uh, Bob Jones University, the guy that founded that, I think he started preaching when he was 13 years old. No, no, <laughs> too young. That's too young. And that guy made a mess of things. Um, yeah, he made some good statements and whatever else, uh, but he made some real big messes too. Uh, you know, I know it was at a different time, you know, and he probably went through some harder stuff than teenagers today and the whole deal, but uh, the Lord... You know, God manifest in the flesh, waited till he was 30 before he went into ministry. So, take some advice there. All right? Um, you're just not ready. Let me give you that verse quick here. 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, um, verse 1. We'll just read down through to verse 6. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, blameless the husband of one wife. You should be married. That makes a man out of you. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. You don't get good behavior until you're older. Okay? <laughs> apt to teach takes time. You have to be patient in things with people. Not given to wine. You have to get you know control over that, that you're not given to wine. <clears throat> no striker. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. That's not stuff that you're just going to pick up after a year of being saved or something. That stuff takes time. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. You're supposed to be a good father, not just a good husband, but a good father. God's very serious about these qualifications here to go into ministry as a bishop. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Yeah, I mean, what kind of a, a man would I be in ministry if I didn't know how to take care of my own house? You know, out here in my son's, you know shooting his BB gun through the window here, and my wife's coming in, you know, and she's smoking a cigarette, and she's half drunk or something, you know, and uh, tune in next week for the next sermon or something. <laughs> huh? No. Um, I have to rule well my own house. That's what I have to do. Verse 6, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Boy, you have to be careful with that one. You get these young guys, and they, you know, especially the Hiles cult, they get these young guys in, and man, they get them, and they're in there, and they're just, you know, oh, brother so and so, you know. I, I mean, I've been through this Baptist system for so many years. I know exactly how these guys do it. And they try to get the young preacher boys, and they get them all excited, and they go out on these, you know, daring, soul winning things. Let's go knock doors, and let's teach you how to go out and. You know, and you go up to the front door and you knock the front door and, you know, the people come to the door and you, and the first it's the older man of God and he's there and he says, um, yes, we're from such and such church. We were just out here today in the neighborhood and we'd like to ask you today, if you were to die right now or tonight, 
well, do you know for sure where you're going when you die? And they say, well, I'm a, well let's just talk about it. And they, and they show them how to do the thing. And then after they've done it a few times, then they go up to the door, they knock on it, and they say, okay, young man, it's your turn. And the young guy goes, oh, and they say, you can do it, you can do it. And then they get the guy, he does his little talk or whatever, and is nervous and he's scared. And then, you know, he pressures the person into saying some prayer for salvation. And then they get him back to the church and then they brag on young brother so-and-so here. I was with him when he led this person to the Lord and, you know, and he's going to be a great soul winner. And, and they build these young guys up, send them off to some place like Hiles Anderson College or Bob Jones University or any of the other places. And they fill their heads full of all this, you know, Bible correcting knowledge. And then they come out and they're, I'm a preacher and, and, you know, I got my first church when I was 21 years old or something. And, and they're out there and they're just, I mean, I've known some of these guys, they just make a wreck of things. It's just terrible. You know, and a lot of these Baptist preachers, you hear their testimonies. I know one of you brought this up in the comments, one of the videos I did here recently. A lot of these Baptist pastors, you say, what's your testimony? Well, I got saved in Sunday school as a young child. Uh, uh, uh. <clears throat> Hold on there. I don't think you understood salvation. And then you look at the way the guy's ministry is going and everything else and you know, and they have problems. And next thing you know, well, where's brother so-and-so? Where's pastor so-and-so? Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> you know, he cheated on his wife and, you know, he's busted his family up. And... Oh, but he had pride. <clears throat> There's really something there for a while. All started when he was a young man. Oh, you know, well, he had promise and he had, he was going to be the greatest soul winner since Billy Sunday or something. <sighs> I mean, Jack Hiles was an expert at that stuff getting these young preacher boys in and, and he would just mind control. I mean, watch the videos where these young preacher guys, they're just sitting there, sitting there with their Bible, you know, <clears throat> like this. They're sitting there with their hands on their Bible and just going, just staring, you know, and, uh, wow, you know, and, you know, and he could just control those guys, those young guys, a bunch of novices. And you just appeal to the pride a little bit, and then you control them. That's the whole thing. That's what these guys do. I've been through it. You know, again, it's not just some kind of a thing I'm looking at as an outsider or whatever. I was preaching in Baptist churches in the pulpit, suit and tie, the whole deal. If you don't know about my past, um, I understand it very well. So what's this have to do with surviving war again? <laughs> um, what I'm saying is, brethren, uh, you have to be very careful about the thing of pride if you go into any kind of ministry. And um, if you're not careful, the devil will get you with that whole thing. Um, and if you're a young man, I really suggest you just, you know, find some kind of a secular work to do or whatever else and learn some things. Get some scars on your hands, all right, from work-related accidents. All right, uh, get some calluses on those fingers. Have those fingers toughen up. My high school ring, just to say it this way, I mean, I was, I was a skinny bean pole, it's terribly skinny. My high school ring doesn't even fit on any of my fingers anymore. I might be able to get it a little bit on my pinky, but, you know, why? Well, because after high school, I was working on a train, serving food, uh, historic Strasburg Railroad in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I worked in logging. I worked in firewood sales. I was a wood turner. I was carving wood as well. I did cabinet making. I did uh, tree work for people cutting trees down and things in people's yards and the whole deal, you know, buying people's houses and felling them the opposite direction, all that stuff. Um, rode dirt bikes. I rode, you know, street bikes. I had uh, ATVs. And I mean, I'd, I've done a lot of different things like that. It was not just some kind of a thing of, I'm just going to be a young preacher boy and I'm just going to go to some Bible Institute someplace. And now I can come out and I, I'll make YouTube videos or whatever else. And I'm a hot shot or something because I, paid for bots to artificially inflate my channel or whatever else. That's not it at all. Um, and I'm thankful for all that the Lord put me through in the past because it helped me to prepare me for what I'm going through right now. You know? So, I'm going to conclude here with a interesting little paragraph here. It is not the critic who counts not the one who points out how the strong man stumbled or how the doer of deeds might have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with sweat and dust and blood, 
who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who, if he wins, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. You say, what's that? Is that uh, from the Bible? No, it's some worldly philosophy, but it, uh, it's pretty good. You say, what's that from? Right there. One of my favorite books on uh, a soldier, a great soldier, Gunnery Sergeant Carlos N. Hathcock II. Not junior, the second, if you understand anything about this book. Um, am I recommending Christians read this book? Not really, because it's got a lot of profanity in it. But uh, this guy was a super soldier. He was a tough individual. And it's interesting because uh, one of the stories, the thing that got him out of the military uh, when he was in Vietnam, there was an improvi improvised explosive device, IED, and it was underneath, it was on the road, and, um, and it was set off remotely, if I remember the story correctly. It was made out of wood so that the mine detectors couldn't you know, pick it up, the metal detector, mine detector things. And uh, they set it off while the troop carrier was over top of it that Carlos Hathcock was on the back of. And boom, it blew up and lit the whole thing on fire and everything else, big fireball. And the concussion from it knocked out every soldier that was on that thing except for Carlos. And what did Carlos do? He said, I need to get off of here. I have a wife to think about back home. I, I have my career. I have my... No, Carlos stayed on top of that burning troop carrier and grabbed every Marine off of that thing and threw him out of the fire. Grabbed another one, pulled him out of the fire, threw him off. Pulled him out of the fire, threw him off. Until all the soldiers were free from that flames, from the flames. And by doing that, he himself got burned. He spent himself in a worthy cause. Here's the picture of him in his hospital bed. September, September 17th, 1969, the day after the ambush and fire in which Hathcock is burned over the majority of his body, Major General Ormond R. Simpson, Commanding General 1st Marine Division, visits him aboard the USS Repose to congratulate him on his heroism. Right there it is. There he is. That's character, brethren. Real character. And uh, you aren't going to get that just from watching a bunch of YouTube videos and learning the Bible to your head just stuffed full of all this wisdom and understanding and everything. Um, pray that the Lord puts you into situations where you can grow as a young man, um, as a young woman out there. Say, Lord, uh, teach me how to work with my hands. Teach me how to do things that would make me a great keeper at home someday. Uh, teach me how to make clothing. Teach me how to knit things and sew things and cook things and to clean and to do whatever. Learn things. Study things. Uh, watch out for the pride thing. All right? That's very important. So, I don't know what's going to come, brethren. Um, there's a lot of things right now that I know are prophesied in the Scriptures. You know, um, plain and simple. Uh, there will be a one world government coming. There will be a mark of the beast. There will be some of those other things. Uh, in an upcoming study, I'll be talking about the things that we can change and the things we can't change. But uh, how bad could it get? I don't know. But one thing is certain. You will be going through war of some way, shape, or form. And I pray that you take heed to the study here today and you think about it. And you realize, you know what? Um, my commanding officer, the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, the Bible calls him, he'll reward me someday if I remain faithful to him. Um, and it doesn't matter what people think about me. And uh, I can't quit on him. And I can't quit on his book. So I hope that that's been an encouragement to you, brethren. And um, stay strong. Okay, think about heaven. Think about what we have to look forward to. Don't ever let anybody take your weapon from you, your King James Bible. So we will see you in the next study. Thank you very much for your support of this ministry, and thank you for watching.
King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.